Welcome everyone to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast. I'm a networking expert and the author of the upcoming book, No, No Strangers, How to Build Community, One Relationship at a Time. My why is the pursuit of mastery, and the goal of this podcast is to lock arms on a lifelong mission of daily personal growth to become the best version of ourselves. So let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We are joined by a very special guest. In my opinion, she's one of Canada's best independent singer-songwriters, and she's written one of my favorite songs of this year called Slip Away. So welcome to the podcast, Cassidy Taylor. Cassidy, how are you? And how good does it feel? How excited are you that you have a new single called Clean that's coming out in the next few days? Hey, thank you so much for having me, first of all. Um, I'm super excited to do this. I've never gone so in-depth with my music, so super pumped. Um, I'm so excited to have a new song coming out uh, on Friday. It's called Clean, and um, it's definitely different from what I've put out there before, so super excited. (laughs) That's awesome. That's awesome. So I like to start the interviews by sharing how I know the guests. So it's showing the power of networking, of building communities, of relationships. And in our case, when I was working at Metalworks, you were there as a vocal student. So that's how we ended up in the same orbit, I suppose. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I was hosting a bunch of different events. One of them was an open mic and you came out maybe two or three times and performed at the open mics. Uh, That that's where I became a fan of you as a, as a musician, as a singer songwriter uh, of your music. And, and then, uh, you know, we've been friends on Facebook since then the last few years. So I I get your Mm -hmm. updates. You do a good job uh, posting your music and updating fans on what's going on. And when you released the song slip away a few months ago, uh, I I loved it. I mean, this is the biggest compliment you can ever get. This is the highest acclaim (laughs) you'll ever get is I have a Spotify playlist that's called great songs. (laughs) <laughs> and I added that song to my great songs playlist. And, uh, you know, you have, you have a few thousand plays of that song. And I swear like 30% of those plays are me like on a daily <laughs> basis playing it. So that's, that's how we know each other. And I, I wanted to start off this, uh, this interview, this podcast episode, I want to start it off powerfully. So I reached out to somebody for a little help. So someone's helping me kick this off and totally. And you know this person, an amazing singer, songwriter. And what's funny is I got a surprise from her yesterday because during the day, I was messaging her uh, to get these kind words for you. And I had no idea, but uh, I have tickets to all of Blues Fest. So I'm there for like 12 days seeing amazing artists. And last night I was there for Sarah McLaughlin, who is the headliner. And lo and behold, the person I got the quote from who I had talked to during the day was there on stage playing bass and singing with Sarah McLaughlin. I had no idea that I was about to see the person that I was talking to. So this is from uh, Melissa McClelland, who's an amazing singer songwriter. Mm. She has a ton of success as a solo artist with her husband, Luke Doucette. They have a a group called White Horse that's popular. Uh, She has credits for, for music with Matt Good. Uh, Matthew Good uh, with uh, Blue Rodeo and as well as Sarah McLaughlin. So this is what uh, Mm -hmm. Melissa has to say about one Cassidy Taylor. She says, I did a writing session with Cassidy a few years ago and was blown away by her ability to sing a perfect melody and lyric into existence. She is definitely wise beyond her years and an excellent singer and artist. I'm looking forward to seeing where her music takes her in life. She is a lovely human and a talented artist. That's from Melissa. Oh, thank you. I haven't seen her in so long. Yeah. Um, we got connected to, uh, through a record label, um, from Ottawa blues fest. There was a contest that I won. Um, anyways, we connected and we, uh, got into a a session together with, uh, Luke as well. Um, and it was, it was amazing. Honestly, those two are so talented and like, I couldn't believe the amount of energy they brought to the room. It was really, really inspiring. Those are uh, relationship goals right there. The two of them yes, right? totally. working together and super talented and making great music and 
you know, touring is the the backing band for Sarah McLaughlin. So uh, we're, we're going to dive into your your discography, all the songs you've released, what's what you're up to. But we're going to start by going all the way back to the beginning. So do you do you, do you have an earliest musical memory? Is there a time where music became important to you for the first time? Uh, you know, where did this love of music come from? That's a great question. Um, earliest musical memory. Honestly, I've always known that I wanted to be a musician. It was never like, like there was no light bulb moment for me where like, I was like, oh, I, I want to do this. Like um, ever since I can remember, I've been wanting to do this. And like, I thought growing up, it was like, I thought just everyone wanted to do this. And this was like everyone's goal. I was like, you know, who wouldn't want to sing songs and write songs and perform every day? Who wouldn't want to do that? And as I grew up, I realized not, not everyone wants to do this. It's just, it's kind of me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I kind of just, I went with it. Um, my biggest influence as a kid, as you can probably guess is Taylor Swift. Um, I listened to her like every day in my room for, I don't know how long years. And I started playing her songs. Um, then I started writing songs that I, I don't know, I thought were kind of similar to hers. I kind of just wanted to be her when I was a kid. And so, yeah, that's kind of where the inspiration with the guitar came from. Um, I started writing songs before I even started playing guitar at all. Um, and then my dad used to play guitar when he was a teenager. So he had a guitar laying around the house and I was like, hey, I want to play that. And to be honest, the first time I tried guitar, I hated it. <laughs> I completely hated it and I put it down. And then like two months later, I was like, I really, I really want to play it though. Like I, I just, I need to play this, this instrument. So I got back on it and I don't know what changed, but I ended up loving it and ended up using it to write more songs. <laughs> and, and why do you think you hated the guitar at first? Was it the, the pain of the fingers? You know, it, it, it's painful mm -hmm. if, if you haven't built up the calluses, it's hard on the mm -hmm. muscles in the hand. Was it that <laughs> you just couldn't perform what you wanted to, like the talent wasn't there yet? What was it? Uh, I don't know, like maybe something to do with the hands. Uh, my dad's guitar was like, it was like a really old guitar, right? So the strings in the fretboard were like this far away. Like they were like really it's even harder to play. A, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I probably couldn't even play it today. Um, I don't know how I did it, but uh, maybe it was that I also like the way I learned was a little different. Like I remember the first time I tried it, I learned by, you know, I printed off like a sheet that had, um, put this finger on this fret and it was like words on a on a page so like I would do it and then I would like strum the chord be like great and then I'd move on to the next one and then I forget what the first one even was and I got really really frustrated by this um the second time I tried it I went for more like pictures <laughs> and and visual things which I'm a super visual person like um so I think tabs that show you like what finger on what fret yeah yeah exactly kind of like tabs um I think my dad even had a guitar book that actually showed like a person playing the core like a picture of their hands which I think helped me a lot um yeah so maybe that kind of changed everything I don't know and and you you mentioned that you thought everyone wanted to be a, a singer songwriter or a musician <laughs> do you do you think like were you surrounded with a ton of musicians so that was the norm or it's just your love of music kind of like blinded you like oh if I love this mm -hmm. everyone must love this yeah I think growing up a lot of people around me, like me and my friends as kids, we used to just like put on concerts for our, our family and like, you know, sing at sleepovers and whatever it was. Right. Um, so I don't know. I just I loved it so much that I was like, I really want to do this. And every time I saw someone perform, um, I was like, I want to be up there so bad. Like, I want to do that. And I don't know, I guess maybe other people didn't take it as seriously as I did as a kid. Um, I, I probably didn't realize that at the time. But yeah, I think it just kind of faded out for some people and it just really stuck with me. So you, you mentioned Taylor Swift as like your original inspiration or maybe still your greatest inspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, I, okay, here, I'm, I have a confession. Are you ready for this confession? I'm ready. I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> so I'm a big Taylor Swift fan. Uh, I call her Tay Tay. Yes. Like that's how much, that's how connected we are. I call her Tay Tay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I talked about you being on my great songs playlist on Spotify. Like my Spotify is like my deepest love. I listen to like three hours of music a day and I created, you'll love this. I created a, the best of Tay Tay playlist. So I went through her entire discography, which is like hours of music. That's and amazing. 
And every song that I liked, I moved to the best of Tay Tay. And mm. let's say she has, I don't know, I'm just making up numbers, but let's say she has like 150 songs. I have like 137 songs on the best of Tay Tay, which means I pretty much like everything she does. So I thought I would just put that out there in the ether, uh, get that confession out and, and, you know, I'll sleep better at night now that the world knows. Yeah, that's awesome. A fellow Swifty for sure. A Swifty, Honestly, is that the official name for the fan base? It is. Yeah. Swifties. <laughs> okay. I guess I wasn't um, as big a fan as I thought. So. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, yeah, no, her, her music is so versatile too. Like it's so like streamlined in a songwriting sense, but then like, she's got, you know, pop, she's got country, she's got folk, you know, she's got it all. So I think that's really cool. The, the pandemic has been a great time for you and the rest of the Swifties because uh, <laughs> with her not being able to tour, she really picked up the output of her recorded music. So she set an all-time record. Uh, she had three number one albums in like a year period. It was something, I don't know, 12 months or 14 months. So you got uh, Folklore was the second one. Uh, no, Folklore was the first one. What was the second one? The one with Willow? Uh the second one was, uh, oh my God, why can't I remember the name of it? Uh, folklore, Willow. Uh, folklore. <laughs> and, uh... Anyways, so she had, she had two albums of original music within like eight months. And then she started re-recording all her albums. So the first one that she mm -hmm. did, the re-record, um, that one went to number one. So have you felt like there's been this gift of all this Taylor Swift music coming in during the pandemic? Totally. Yeah. Um, and I honestly, I still want more, <laughs> but I know she's given us so much. Um, but yeah, I can't get enough, to be honest. Um, folklore was like a super great experience for me. It was like the first time I had listened to something that was so like, I don't know, it was so like magical. And like she'd written all these stories about like other made up situations, which was a really cool concept because you think that a songwriter would write about themselves and what they go through. But it's possible to just write about things that haven't even happened ever um, and you're just like making it up so I thought that was a super cool concept and it's definitely influenced my songwriting and it's it's cool that you know she started as country she moved into more pop then it was kind of dancey and then mm -hmm. those two albums are like stripped down folk you know it's like a different totally. side of her which is awesome so is the second album is it evermore yes evermore, evermore. okay that's the one all right we had, we had to get that, mm. we had to get that straight. Um, <laughs> it, so you, you started playing music at a young age. Is it true that you actually were writing short stories before you're writing lyrics and music? Or is this, is this all erroneous information? <laughs> no, that's actually, it's true. Um, I wrote, I wrote like short stories and books. Um, I, I tried writing like a full novel. Um, and like I did, it just, it was like the first draft and I didn't get past that, but it, I mean, it made no sense, <laughs> but I did it. Um, I finished like a, a whole book, wrote it by hand, um, in a notebook from start to finish. And yeah, I, I don't know. I just loved writing as a kid. Everything about it was like, you know, my dream. What can you give us a synopsis of this <laughs> unreleased yeah. novel? I totally can. Yeah. It was, uh, it was called adopted by a ghost. And um, that's well, an intriguing and, title. OK, you have yeah. so far you have my attention. Yeah, the title, um, I think, explains it all. It's about this this girl who got adopted by two ghosts and she doesn't know it yet. And like she went through life up until like her teens, like thinking that these were her parents and whatever. And then she like finds her her real parents like gravesite. And like it was it was pretty dark thinking about it. But like, yeah, that was the concept. <laughs> That's that's actually an amazing concept. Like that that sounds like <laughs> so Neil Gaiman is like a, an amazing fiction writer. He wrote mm -hmm. um oh my god, uh Coraline, which is more like kid stuff, but mm -hmm. um uh, um uh, American Gods, he's written like all these uh oh, dark what is it omens anyways. Neil Gaiman is like one of the best fiction writers of all time and it's that sounds like something he would write. He always has this like dark <laughs> undertone. And I think that's an amazing mm. concept. How, how have you not like Thanks. rewritten this as an adult? And I don't know. I'm honestly, like a New York Times bestseller. Yeah, I've thought about it. I've thought about like starting to write 
um, books again, just because I just love it so much, even just as like hobby, not even to to publish it or anything. But I don't know, maybe you'll think about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I'm I'm writing. I have a few ideas for books and none of my ideas are that good. So I think you should, I think you should run with that. Um, Was there anything you wanted to be? So you said right away, you knew that you wanted to be a musician. Was there anything you wanted to be as a kid before uh, wanting to be a musician or wanting to be a writer, I suppose? Mm -hmm. I do remember like, I mean, this was probably when I was really, really young, like kindergarten kind of thing. I wanted to be like a teacher, but it probably came from just like my only experience leaving the house was like seeing my teachers and like that's kind of all I knew so maybe that's where that came from um but yeah that's honestly all I remember from there on out it's just like as soon as I discovered music it was just like that was it for me so you, you grew up in Halliburton Ontario so what, yes. what is the the population of Halliburton well the actual town itself is About a thousand people. Maybe it's grown since the pandemic because I know a lot of people um, have moved up to their cottages here from the city. So maybe it's grown. Um, The county itself is much bigger. So everything's very like spread out, right? Like there's a lot of forest. Um, So yeah, I I think the town, I'd have to look it up again. But uh, last time I checked, it was a thousand people in the town of Halliburton, which is where I am. Wow. I, uh, I, I grew up in a town <laughs> called Russell, which was about 3000. And I thought that was small. So um, oh. how, how much do you think growing up in Halliburton actually influenced you as a person and as a musician? Like, do you think that comes out in the music somehow? Oh yeah, totally. Um, it's, it influences so much about who I am and, and my writing style. I write a lot about nature. I think that um, it, it makes sense. Like I make sense of a lot of situations by relating them to nature I don't know why it just makes sense for me in my head um like slip away kind of is like a river um clean talks a lot about fire which you'll you'll soon hear um and like the upcoming songs are a lot about like the moon and the sun and the atmosphere and that kind of thing um so I think that growing up around nature has like subconsciously made me kind of relate to nature in a really personal way so that's one way it's it's influenced me. Another is that I'm a very trusting person. Like I, I, I this changed when I moved to the city, but I'm very quick to trust people, even to this day. Maybe a little less so, just because I've I've been out there now and I've seen other things. But I'm a very very quick person to trust someone. Um, you know, in the city. I quickly learned that when people are honking at you, it's not because they're saying hello, (laughs) it's because they're, they're mad at you. (laughs) Um, So learn that pretty quickly. Um, Yeah, that's, that's a few ways it's influenced me. So if, if we were friends when you were 16 and you invited me over to listen to music, what albums would you be spinning? And before you answer that, Mm -hmm. I have to point out, I don't know how this happened, but my shirt matches your couch. And I just had to point that out for for people. So for those, sure. that, those that are just listening, I apologize, but we both have, I don't even know, what is this turquoise? I don't know. There's weird. Yeah. Color. Actually, I mean, Zoom is making it look a little more blue. It's actually green. It's green. It does look, it does look blue on screen. I, I might or might not be colorblind. So maybe it, they don't actually match, but to me, they, they match <laughs> a little bit. So yeah, favorite, uh, I guess. Yeah. What, what albums at 16 would you be spinning for me? Definitely Taylor Swift, Fearless. That is an album I listen to every day for probably three years. Um, another one which I just remembered is Hilary Duff. I listened to a lot of Hilary Duff as a kid. I even saw her in concert. She was the first person I'd ever seen live. Um, yeah, and that's that's all I can really remember, to be honest, like physical CDs. Hmm. Uh, did you ever buy, is it stuff by Duff stuff from Duff? She had like a whole collection. <laughs> she built her own like enterprise of, I don't know, clothing or something stuff by Duff. I might be making oh. that up, but I think, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't carry on with the Hillary Duff thing too much. Um, I think Taylor Swift kind of t- took my attention. <laughs> they didn't have the, the, uh, Duff line in Halliburton available probably. <laughs> no, yeah. no, probably not. <laughs> You had mentioned before that you knew from an early age that you wanted to be a musician, but at what point did you know that you had a a gift, that you actually had something of value to offer and that this could be something you could pursue as a career? I remember my first performance outside of like 
school talent shows was at a private event in, well, about half hour away from Halliburton. Um, and when I performed, a lot of people came up to me and they were like, oh my gosh, like you're going to go so far. And like, I don't know, I got so many compliments. Like I was bombarded and I was totally not expecting it. And uh, I don't know, I think that was a big light bulb moment for me because it was the first time I had performed you know, outside of school. It was the first performance of mine that was in front of real people, not just my, my classmates and their parents, you know? So yeah, I think that was probably a big light bulb moment for me. So you're, you're soft spoken, you're a self-proclaimed introvert. So is it difficult as an introvert that is pursuing a career in like the least private, most social <laughs> industry ever? Um, totally. Yeah. I think a lot of people uh, confuse introvert with being shy um, and they're totally not the same thing, though. I would say I'm probably both, um, but introverted is like I get a, my energy restored from like being on my own and kind of just isolating by myself. Uh, not because I, you know, I'm sad or whatever. I just I need to recharge away from people. Um, so I think that in an indus industry that's so like it requires so much of me being out there, me talking to people. I think that I need to take some extra time for myself. A lot of the time I find that after like a performance or after a night out, I really need to like make sure that to keep my mental health in check because it's, it gets a lot to be, it gets a lot for my brain to, you know, comprehend and just go through. So I, I think that I kind of compensate for that by taking extra time to just relax and recharge. There is a book called Quiet that I read. Uh, I mm -hmm. think it's Susan Cain, Susan something anyways. And it's basically about the power of being an introvert and like there's it's like a superpower so some people think maybe it's a weakness right that like mm -hmm. people are too shy or scared or not confident but she comes across with with all this data of the strength of of an introvert so that that would be a a, a book that's worth uh, checking out so i uh, yeah you know that's in, awesome. a, in, in a you know wanting to understand people more uh, you know, I'm an mm -hmm. extrovert. Uh, so I, I wanted to check out that book. See what's the fuss is all about these introverts, <laughs> you know, see, see what's going on there. Yeah. That's super cool. Um, very interesting. Yeah. I find that being an introvert, like I write a lot on my own in my room with a guitar and maybe that comes from being an introvert. I'm very like internal. Like I think a lot and my mind is always going, it's always racing. Um, it's always coming up with new ideas. Sometimes this can get in, in the way of being around so many people because my mind is just racing. I'm like thinking about what that person's doing. And then like, I'm hearing this thing over here and then it's like, you know, sensory overload for me sometimes. Um, so yeah, maybe it influences the songwriting for sure. Do you have, do you have trouble sleeping because you have just too many <laughs> ideas and things going on? Actually, no, I've never really had trouble sleeping. Um, I, I honestly, I'm a pretty like, I sleep pretty easily, which I'm, I'm thankful for. Um, so yeah, I never really have that problem. But I do always like, I have this problem where I'll be almost asleep and I'm so comfortable. And then I get an idea. I'm like, oh, like, it's really good. I have to get up now. <laughs> and I have to get my phone and I have to record it or write it down or something. Um, so yeah, probably... that, that idea might never come again, right? So you have to yeah. like you have to honor that like digital download from the <clears throat> infinite intelligence or source or whatever. You know? Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you do you journal at all? Um, sometimes, yeah. I have a I have a journal that I that I write in when I'm feeling like super overwhelmed. Uh, I usually just kind of like spill my thoughts out onto paper. That's kind of how I process things. Um. I also do like some manifesting too. I've gotten into that recently and I find that super powerful. Just like writing down where you want to be and like pretending like you're already there. It's just like, it's really, really powerful. I recommend it to everyone. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, um, there's a book called, uh, oh my God, hold on, hold on, hold on. Anyways, there's, there's this thing called the morning pages and it comes from um, this woman, mm -hmm. I think it's uh, Julia Cameron, and she she she's basically been a coach for creative people for 
years and she taught courses and everyone's like, Oh, you got to write a book. You got to share this. And, and she's about empowering artists and, and helping artists and, and how to live a life of creativity. So, you know, it's, it's like once a week, you should set up a date with yourself uh, doing something creative to get those energies out. Uh, A lot of creative people are like you, where it's like, they're always thinking and they always have ideas. And a lot of them can't sleep because it's like the brain's always going, which is why I asked you. Um, so mm-hmm. I've been writing, She, it, it's called the morning pages and it's for creative people. And it's every morning when you wake up, you write about three pages worth of stuff. And it's literally just whatever comes out. It could be ideas or fears or dreams or how you're feeling. And it's like, you can physically take what's up there and put it out somewhere. And it's, it's like that clearing of energy allows you to have more clarity and, and to sleep and, and, and all those things. So anyways, it's called the morning pages is like the technique that's used. It's a form of journaling, but for creative people. And, um, Interesting. and yeah, the book, uh, it's the artist's way, I think something like that. Anyways, I should get cool. all my book titles straight before I bring, <laughs> bring them up in the interviews. But, but anyways, that's why I asked about, uh, about journaling. Um, mm-hmm. my, my, my next question for you is, you know, as a musician myself, it's, we're often told to, to get an education, get a good job, play it safe. Um, did you, have you run into that resistance from family or friends that are like, Oh, be realistic, get a, get a real Mm -hmm. job. That whole musician entertainment industry thing. That's, that's a hobby. That's not a job. Have you, have you dealt with that? And if so, how do you push through that? Yeah, I actually was pretty fortunate growing up. My parents uh, really supported me and what I wanted to do. Um, I think that them themselves, they never really got the opportunity to, follow their passion or never really had maybe the encouragement to follow their passion. So, or maybe they didn't even know their passion. Um, So I think that they really wanted to give me that opportunity to chase those dreams and like chase those opportunities. So I've been super fortunate in that sense. Um, Never really encountered anyone who's at least maybe confronted me about it. Um, Maybe they're thinking it, I don't know. Um, but no one's ever actually said it to me. So I've been super fortunate. <laughs> and for, for our listeners that maybe haven't heard your music before, how, how do you, how do you describe it? So we're, we're going to send them to go listen to it, but for now, how would you describe the sound? Yeah, I would describe my sound as con- uh, adult contemporary pop with an indie twist. Um, and I think that my, my music feels like, emotionally different from what you'd hear on the radio per se I write lyrics to you know be thought through and I write lyrics really thoughtfully um they're not necessarily something you'd get on the first listen which is just how I like it so that's what you can expect so I'm gonna read this next thing so I don't mess it up so uh you were the 2019 (laughs) music counts scholarship recipient. So it was $5,000 in a financial contribution and an intensive mentorship and networking experience to accelerate your career. So how did that all come to fruition? And how did you invest that $5,000 into your career? Yeah, I, um, well, first of all, I was nominated from my school, um, which was super awesome. I cared so much about this scholarship. Um, when I, when I submitted the application, I was just like, I was just hoping that I would get it so bad. And I remember getting that call and it was like the happiest moment of my life. Like I was in tears, like it was a big thing because it meant that I got to, you know, invest that money into music and someone in college who, you know, doesn't have time for, for work. I mean, my, my course wasn't a typical, you know, six month sort of thing that normal universities do. It was like a, it was longer than a typical school year. It was, it was 11 months of the year. I was studying for two years straight. So I had no time to work, no time to save. I, you know, the finite, the financial situation was like not ideal for someone who has to put in so much to get something out of it. So this $5,000 meant so much to me. And I, I budgeted out every cent of that, that money. I remember having like a spreadsheet and I was like, okay, $200 is going to go to photography. Like this is going to go to studio time and like 
I was so, so meticulous about it because I was so, so um, grateful that I got that opportunity. You're, you're way more organized than the <laughs> average musician, I think. Yeah, I, I actually, I'm a huge neat freak. Like everything has to be a certain way. Um, I will say though, the one thing that isn't organized in my life is songwriting. That's the one thing I allow myself to kind of be completely free and messy in whatever it needs to be. You, you mentioned before when I, I provided the quote from Melissa, um, was that from, from this mentorship, the 2019 music counts, mm-hmm. or was that something else? No, that was actually something else. Uh, I won a contest at Ottawa Blues Fest in... You're just out here winning all the contests. What's going on here? (laughs) You can't leave some contests to other people? What is this? That's awesome. Honestly, both of these I was not expecting at all. Um, But 2017, I think it was 2017, I won a um, She's the One competition at Ottawa Blues Fest, which was a competition for uh, female, young female artists to win a one song record deal where I'd, you know, write a song or get a lot of songs. We, I had so many writing sessions to find the one song that we wanted to produce and release. And then I got to produce it. Um, we got it mixed, mastered and released it. And I did the whole, the whole shebang. And uh, yeah, one of those songwriting sessions was, was White Horse. Okay. And what, what was the song that you ended up going? What was the one that you? you Yeah, it was, it was called Lucky. I actually decided to take it down from streaming services um, for a few reasons. It honestly, it didn't feel like me. Um, I think that being with a label was great, but I feel like I didn't, I don't know. It wasn't really me what was happening with the whole, I don't know, everything about it was just kind of like, Maybe I hadn't really figured myself out yet and I wouldn't have expected them to figure it out for me, but I just think the whole thing wasn't really true to who I was. Yeah, it was a, I guess it was just a, a an amazing experience and, and totally was some growth there as an artist that led you to who you are today and your style today. Yeah, totally. Totally. So the, the last two years with the pandemic, have been insanely hard on musicians. I mean, the entertainment industry was wiped out overnight. I mean, I used to do a bunch of events and then overnight I've, I've done zero in the last two years. And the more I talk to musicians on this podcast, the more I see like the heartbreak uh, and the challenges they've gone through. Um, you know, it's, it's their, their, um, ability to make money in the last two years was wiped out. Uh, the, the mental health, uh, all those challenges where they're, they're telling me they no longer know if their skills are, are needed. Like, are they just mm. useless now as a musician? If there's no music going on, if there's no live events, it's like, do I have this, you know, bag of skills that's antiquated that, you know, we didn't know at one point we didn't know if there'd ever be live shows again, right. Before the, before the, um, the vaccines and all that. So it's like, I've, I've heard about all this heartbreak. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the challenges during the pandemic for you as a musician. I mean, you've released four new songs during the pandemic with a fifth one on its way. Um, you know, all the music you've released that I've seen has been during this pandemic. So it's not all bad for you, but what have the challenges, uh, been for you anyways during this pandemic and how have you overcome them? I met my producer, uh, Yanni is his name. I met him just before the pandemic hit. Like I think a few months before this whole thing happened, we, we met, we started working together. So I was super fortunate, um, to have, have met him at the time. We actually decided to move in together because whenever when everything hit because I was like I don't well we want to record a song we want to do all these things but I don't want to have to self-isolate for two weeks every time I see you and after I get home you know like so we were like you know we can't go anywhere else so why don't we just move in together and just make music so we did it and that's where um Pretty Before Daylight and Speak of the Devil came came from so uh yeah, that was that was I was super fortunate to be able to do that. That's not something I think a lot of artists can can say they were able to do. Some challenges though with the mental health for sure. I think the isolation, even though I'm an introvert, I still have like, you know, social needs. Like I still need to talk to people and I think for the for the first like 6 months I was like, 
okay. I was like, all right, this is fine. Um, but after that point, I was kind of like, okay, I really want to like see my family, see my friends. And like, it got a little, I don't know. I got a little depressed for sure. I think we all did. Um, yeah, I just, I had that, that need for social interaction and it, we just couldn't do it. Um, so yeah. So with, with you and your producer, both quarantined together, uh, living in the same space, is that where you recorded the songs or you recorded elsewhere? Yeah, we actually, he had a home studio already, so that worked out really well. Uh, we recorded all of it, um, in his basement and yeah. <laughs> yeah. The recordings sound, sound great. Like they sound Thank super you. Yeah. professional. He, yeah. He's a super, super talented engineer and producer. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> how, how frustrated ha- were you during those two years where you couldn't perform live? Because I know playing live is like your favorite thing. For sure. I think that I definitely developed a deeper appreciation for live music and performing live. I don't know. I, before it was, now I don't really get as nervous as I used to because it's like, give it your all because you don't know when the the next time you're going to be able to do this is you know like things could change in in a second and I think the pandemic taught taught us that so yeah I I honestly I didn't start feeling the effects of the performing probably for the first year or so um my introverted self was like comfortable I was like okay this is this is okay like I wasn't I wasn't happy about it but I wasn't you know probably in in a worse spot where I could have been um so yeah, I, I started feeling that probably about a year in. I was like, I really just want to play. Like, I just want to play live, especially with other people. That was one thing. I couldn't play with other people. And uh, which I'm I'm super excited to be playing with a full band on the 20th, July 20th, again, for the first time. So that's been super fun. Um, but yeah, I definitely found it frustrating for sure. And that show is at the supermarket in Toronto? Yes, it is. And who, who are the other artists on the bill? It looks like two other female singer songwriters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have uh, Rachel Hickey and Avery Raquel. Yeah. They're super talented. I'm so excited to be playing alongside them. That's, that's a legendary venue as well. I've, uh, yes, it I've, is. I've, I, I started by playing the open mics there. So on Sundays they have free fall, uh, free fall Sundays, uh, hosted mm. by, uh, Tony Rabello, who is the drummer for joy drop. And, um, oh man, there's one other person that hosts it, but anyways, um, that's a great venue. I hosted different events there. Like I, I actually booked the venue and booked bands there and that's a man, oh, that's, that's awesome. a great spot. Like you can yeah. fit a, a good number of people in there. The location is awesome. Um, d- did you pick up any new hobbies during the pandemic? Some people like started, you know, garden, some people started baking, uh, anything new, <laughs> anything new come up for you or what? Yeah, definitely. I, I started baking. Um, more recently I've started actually like making my own bread, which is like, it's become a weekly tradition now. Um, yeah, that's something that I started doing, uh, baking. I definitely became a foodie in those two years. Um, my boyfriend is an amazing cook. So you know, I, I, he made me a foodie for sure. And I have like a deep appreciation for good food. Um, so that changed. I never used to be a foodie and like my family isn't like super big on cooking and food. So it was completely something I wasn't expecting, but yeah. (laughs) So if I wanted to be able to start labeling myself a foodie, what would I have to do to check off all the boxes? I think, I don't know. I think is it just like think, a love of food? Is it like always looking for the best restaurants? Is it cooking yourself? What is a foodie? I want to be a foodie. How do I? I love food. I eat way too much of it. Does that count? <laughs> no, probably not. No, I relate. Um, I think a foodie can be like defined as someone who like just has a deep appreciation for good food. You know, um, I think some people think that it means that you just like eating a lot, which I don't know. I don't agree with that. I think it's more like you, you know what good food is and you appreciate it when you, when you have it, you know? Well, I have a quote here from a good Italian that really knows his food. This is probably a foodie. (laughs) So this is from Alf Annabellini. So yes, Alf. he is a member of the super group envy of none with Alex Lifeson Mm. from rush. Um, And 
as an as an engineer and producer and mixer, he's also worked with the Arkells, Tea Party, Our Lady Peace, DMX, Blue Rodeo, I'm Mother Earth, Nelly Furtado. So this is a powerhouse in the entertainment totally. industry. And uh, he was he was our guest on episode number 56. And what's what's awesome is that episode came out and, you know, he's super humble and you know, there's a two year plus history of this podcast and his episode went, uh, I think it's the second most played episode we've ever had. Like just people love Alf, people love Envy of None. And uh, Mm. this is what he has to say. He says, Cassidy shows great artistic depth for someone so early in her musical journey. Please tell her I say hello. So that's from Alf. Oh, hi Alf. (laughs) It's been a long time. It's uh, how long ago were you, were you a student? Was he a, a teacher of yours? He point? was, yeah. He he taught me. Um, I believe it was a mixing course, something to do with mixing and, and production. But yeah, I learned so much from him. I definitely he was one of my favorites. Yeah, he has such a like laid back and mm-hmm. comforting vibe. You know, he's just like totally. You just want to go give him a hug, you know. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. thanks for being my teacher. Uh, so let's yeah. let's dive into the four songs that you've released. So I've listened to them over and over and over again. I got my good headphones on. I'm really listening to production and lyrics and everything. So the first one was "Speak of the Devil." So this is in 2020. Um, so it's it's a dark and haunting song. Uh, I'll read a, a, some of the lyrics here. It says, "I can hardly feel anything now. I've reached a new level." I can barely see anything down this far. So is, is this song about sinking into a depression? That's what I get out of it. Actually, yes, it is. You got that. You, you nailed it right on the head. Um, a lot of people think it's about a relationship, but it's it's definitely not. It's it's about um, being really lonely, really depressed and like not knowing what to do about it rather than to just wait it out. And And was this written during the pandemic, like during those months where the isolation started to kick in, or was that a previous idea? Yeah, this one, this one was, it it came into existence when I was, when I had just moved out um, for the first time when I started college. So years ago, um, yeah, I, I wrote it. I mostly like had this depressive sort of episode when I moved out away from home. I was in, you know, the big city from such a small town it was it was a huge change for me so that's where that came from <clears throat> yeah see see i got the you know the mental health and the depression out of that song it was uh before daylight that felt like the relationship song to me we'll, we'll <laughs> yeah. get into that one in a second but um yeah I, I, you know i mentioned all the musicians i've talked to that a lot of people have struggled with mental health <laughs> during the during the pandemic um do you do you have any tips uh, for people that maybe are struggling with their mental health, maybe, you know, getting into a, a depression, is there anything that's helped you to kind of see the light and snap out of it? Yeah, I I started running a lot. That's something I forgot to mention. I started running a lot during the pandemic and I didn't really realize like how much of an effect it had on my mental health until I started doing it a lot. It really like it forces you to like take a deep breath um, because well, you're running. Um, so it kind of forces you to just breathe and like not think about anything else, you know? Um, one of my favorite things to do is just, you know, work out and, and go really hard on it because it forces me to not think about anything else. It forces your mind to shut off. And that's something that I've learned really, really works, um, over the past two years in the pandemic. A couple of things I've heard is, Um, if you're not in a great place mentally, you need to get out of your head and into your body. So that ties into Mm. what you're saying about running and working out. And also that action is the cure to what ails you. So it's, it's like, you're too, you're too stagnant. You need to get out there. And, and, uh, the thing about working out is you're getting all those good feeling, um, hormones as well. Um, Totally. Mm. And, and that stuff's important. There's like, this might be a bad example, but one of the greatest boxers of all time, his name's Tyson Fury, and he was the world champion and then sunk into like a four-year depression where he ballooned to like, I don't know, 350, 400 pounds. They had to strip his title because he wasn't fighting. He was suicidal and he's made a comeback and he's the world champion again. But he says in interviews, he openly talks about depression and suicide and all that stuff. And he says, Mm -hmm. I know I can beat this 
as long as every day I'm working out, that that's like the antidote is, is as long as I'm working out, my body is feeling good. I'm getting the good chemicals. Like I know if I take it one day, just one day at a time, and I can get that walk in that run in that workout, I know I can beat this, you know, men- mental illness. And I thought that was important as well, which is to your point. of Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah totally. That's yeah. I think that, that puts it perfectly. The, the, so the song we're talking about, Speak of the Devil, I found that it had kind of a Civil Wars vibe. Are you a fan of Civil Wars? And maybe their hit with Taylor Swift from the Hunger Games ties mm-hmm. the Swifty into the, into the Civil Wars. I don't know if, if you're a fan or if. Yeah, I actually, I haven't listened to their stuff too much. Um, I do know them. I do know who they are and I've listened to their music before. I must say though, they weren't really a, uh, an influence or like a reference for Speak of the Devil, but I, I can see how you would you would tie that together for sure. They're very similar to that song. Yeah. They're, I, I think you would love it. They're, they're a master mm. class in harmonies. So it's, yes. it's a guy and a girl and between them, there's mm. say guitar and piano. And if one's singing lead, the other one's singing backups, but their harmonies are like always moving together and, and very unique harmonies. I saw them live and like they pulled off everything perfectly live as well. So it's not like studio trickery. So uh, yeah. they, they only had, I don't know, three albums or so before they broke up. So it's, it'd be easy for you to just dive in, get the whole discography. And Mm -hmm. uh, I think you'd be a massive fan. Like they, they wrote the song that Taylor Swift sings on for the hunger games. Oh, they wrote that. I didn't know they wrote wrote that. And it sounds Mm. like at that time, Taylor Swift was way more, you know, pop. And then that song mm-hmm. has more of that future folklore type sound. And it very much sounds like the civil wars with Taylor Swift. Like they brought her in to sing over what they do. So I think, mm-hmm. I think you would really enjoy the civil wars if, if you're not familiar. Yeah, f- totally. I'm always looking for new music to listen to. So I will check them out for sure. So the, the uh, so talking about the production in that song, speak of the devil, mm-hmm. um, whose idea was it to start with kind of like a high pass filter. So it's just, there's no low end at the start. And then in the first chorus, the all those frequencies start to kind of seep in a bit. And then by mm-hmm. the end of that first chorus and coming out of it, the full band kicks in. Uh, I thought that sounded great and added to the vibe of the song. How did that come to be? Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is one of my favorite things about the song too. Um, <clears throat> That was actually my idea. Um, and at the time, it, I mean, it wasn't an easy thing to just like try out and see if it works. You know, like my producer had to like automate every frequency just to see if it worked too, like not even doing the final thing. And it took him like, I don't even know how long, but he was like, when I when I suggested the idea, he was like, okay, okay, give me, give me a bit, just go away, grab a coffee, come back. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we ended up loving it, but yeah, I think we had like the f- the f- beginning of the song figured out and we had the end of the song figured out, but we didn't know how we wanted it to get there. Um, so that's that's kind of what what inspired that. It, we didn't want it, the drums to come full on in the verse two. We didn't want it to come in the chorus. We're like, how do we want this to happen? I'm like, just, you know, fade it in <laughs> with the frequencies. Yeah, yeah, you're the producer. You figure it out. I have the idea. You, you know, <laughs> you, you figure out the technical aspect, make it happen. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So you, you've mentioned that that song felt so natural when you wrote it, it felt like it was a gift that was just given to you and you're the person that wrote it down and, and fleshed it out uh, to be something people can listen to and put their hands on. Um, Do you, do you believe in, you know, maybe there's some higher power that is like, you're the conduit that it's passing these ideas through. Do you believe that to be true? Yeah, honestly, it it does kind of feel like that. Um, I'm not a, like a religious person. I don't necessarily believe in like a god per se, but I do believe in like energy and like some sort of higher power, you know, like everything happens for a reason kind of thing. So yeah, I do. I definitely do think that that song had to be written. Um, it changed me as a person. I still love it to this day. It's probably like, you know, it's still one of my favorites. Like it's never going to change. It's, it's always going to be one of my favorites. So my last guest on the podcast was Daniel Victor of Neverending White Lights. 
And he had that massive single called The Grace with Dallas Green of City and Color. This was a number one song in Canada. It uh, went gold. And he was talking like he's very spiritual. And he was saying mm-hmm. that he's he's just a vessel. Like everything he's ever done is like it's been given to him. And he just has to be open and, and ready to receive. And that that song, The Grace, like the album was basically done. And there was two days to go before mastering. Like that's the end of, that's the deadline. And Mm. just in a 20 minute period, that entire song came to him and he got Dallas Green of City and Color to record it. They got it to mastering and that made his entire career. Like it's, it's a massive, massive song. So uh, that's Mm. to the point of you, you know, you saying that it just, it felt like it just came to you. And the last thing I would Mm. say about that is the craziest story that I have about, you know, having a gift given to me in the form of a song is uh, when, when I was young, I had a lucid dream. So I was in a dream where I knew I was in a dream. Mm-hmm. Like so clearly I knew that I was in this dream and I could do anything. And with complete control, I in the so I'm still in bed, I'm asleep in the dream. I get up and I go to the next room where I had my guitar And I pick up the guitar and for the entire like eight hours where I'm actually asleep, I'm, it's like I was awake sitting in that room and I'm working on this song and I finished from scratch an entire song, music, lyrics, melody from scratch. And Mm -hmm. I woke up, I got up, I wrote down the lyrics, I hit record, I recorded and I had this song that was given to me in a dream that it's like I was given an extra eight hours of time that I was awake where I could work on a song, but it was while I was asleep. It was the strangest thing. And at the time that was, so it was a song called my greatest fear, which was, I was in a band called distant society. And that was our most popular song basically for our entire career. And it, Mm. it, it was, I, you know, and then you try to recreate that where you're like, man, if every <laughs> night I had eight hours where I could control my dream, like I could be so productive, like I could like yeah. learn other instruments, you know, I can yeah, like, honestly, so I've never been able to recreate that. But that's my story about having something given to me, you know, so that's so cool. Yeah, I, I want a lucid dream. I have lucid dreamt before. Um, and I know what you're talking about. It's it's freaky at first, for sure. Um, and I wish I had control over that because that would be so cool. You'd get an extra eight hours. Like you said, you could just be so productive. Like you could do so many things. Yeah. It's, it's all a dream. Uh, so the second song that you released in 2020 is called before daylight. So this has more of a pop sound, uh, than speak of the devil. It's got a ton of catchy hooks, really good production. Uh, can you talk about, there's like these keys, these kind of spacey sounding keys that are in the song. Do you know what I'm talking about? Does that make any sense? There's, it, it's um, like so. way in the background, like you need headphones and it sounds like, mm. like, like keyboard, like just mm. really spacey notes that add mm-hmm. to the production. I don't know. Maybe they're super subtle that I. Yeah, probably. I, honestly. Yeah. My, my producer would probably know what you're talking about. Um, He, he's really good at adding like really subtle things that just like, but if you, like, you can't hear it, but if you take it away, you can feel that it's gone, you know? Um. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he like threw something in there that I didn't, yeah, I wasn't a part to, of. <laughs> to me, it's adding like a thickness. It's adding mm-hmm. um, production that's adding to the vibe. So uh, I was totally. going to bring bring up later something, but I'll bring it up now is that your songs, all, f- all four that are currently out, they sound like you. So there's the cohesiveness of like, you're the artist and it's your voice and your style of, of writing and lyrically and all that stuff. But all four songs sound different, which is very hard to do, especially when it's like acoustic based, you know, it's not like there's all these crazy instruments that can change up every song. Um, So that's a, that's a compliment that somehow you're able to find originality across songs while keeping a consistency of this is, one artist doing these four songs. And another thing is um, you mentioned Taylor Swift before I'm going to bring up Billie Eilish for a second. So she is the biggest, most successful, most critically acclaimed artist of the last say five years. And she's a master Mm -hmm. at creating atmosphere. There's like a, a, a density to her music. There's atmosphere. 
there's always these hunting haunting undertones. And I find that you have that gift where you have haunting your songs all have this little bit of darkness in there and they all have Mm -hmm. something haunting going on and they have production in the sense of there's little things happening that again, you might not know are there, but you feel them and you would definitely notice if they weren't there. So uh, it is Billy talent, Billy talent is Billy Eilish. Um, someone that you're a fan of and uh, and that, yeah, that's a compliment. I guess I'm just trying to give you a compliment. Basically. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no, thank you so much. Yeah. Her vocals are beautiful. Like, like her doubles and harmonies are just so locked in. Um, that's definitely something we strived for on speak of the devil. I remember the harmonies for that one were so fun. Cause it was just like, sing this line, like as creepy as you possibly can, like just be that's a good totally goal. creepy yeah i know and i i remember we were doing whisper tracks too on top of the vocal and uh it was pretty funny because like i sounded like a demon when i was doing this but but it's well, in the speak song, of the like, devil i mean it's yeah. supposed to be kind of hellish yeah exactly yeah um but it was just like i sounded like a demon because he was like you know sing it like like a, whisper it punchy but like you know get in there and um yeah it sounded like so crazy if you were to listen to it on its own but not in the song it sounded great in the song <laughs> so before daylight there's the lyrics loving you became a habit so have you ever stayed in a relationship longer than you should have been and and my comment to that is you know sometimes we think that the devil we know is better than the devil we don't know which means that you're in a relationship that you know it's the wrong person you know you should leave but maybe that's still better than being alone or thinking you might be alone forever. Totally. Yeah. I've, I've definitely done it. I'm guilty um, of staying in a relationship longer than I should have. Um, And that's definitely where that song came from. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Loving you became a habit is, is a perfect explanation for it. It's just like, it becomes a habit, you know, you get comfortable. um, It just becomes your daily routine and, it's really difficult to just one day be like, nope, we're going to just, you know, even if you don't really love that person, it's still hard to, to, to break up, you know, in a sense where you're, you're completely changing the routine. You're changing who you're surrounded by your energy. Like it's yeah. And there, there's a history there and there's memories there and, and Mm -hmm. there's always kind of the hope and the optimism that maybe you could get back to, where things were at their, their peak in the relationship and totally. uh, Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think, um, the beginning stages of a relationship are like, of course the best. And then as soon as it it gets a little farther, it's like, okay, um, are you getting bored? Are you like, you don't, you know, was it just the, the thrill of it or whatever? Um, yeah, that's definitely where that song came from. So there's two more songs we're going to dive into. Uh, As a fan, I'm curious, are these singles that are being released, are these leading to an EP or an album that I can digest all at once? Well, um, I will say when we were releasing Speak of the Devil Before Daylight and Pretty, um, it was more of an experimentation with my sound. Um, I didn't really know who I wanted to be as an artist. Um, I had just kind of like... I mean, when the pandemic hit, um, me and my band kind of separated too. So it was like the people that I had known for so long, that we played with for so long, all of that, like everything changed that I knew about music and, and about, you know, everything, <laughs> everything about music changed. So um, it was really about finding who I wanted to be. Did I want to be a pop artist? Did I want to be, you know, like a, a folk and not to put labels on it, but I needed to find like a place for myself in the industry. And I think that the songs I'm releasing now are kind of, I found that place that I, where I want to be. And, uh, you know, this, I'm releasing an EP right now. Um, you may have picked up on it. I haven't said it explicitly. Um, people would only really notice if they're looking into it. Um, but if you've noticed the slip away artwork has like a one out of five in the corner and then like the clean has two out of five in the corner. So, uh, there's these five songs that I'm I'm putting out slowly and um yeah they really feel like they're me you know even though they're completely different um they really feel like they're part of who I am and like who I want to be as an artist moving forward 
So the the five song EP, it'll be the four songs plus the new single clean. Is that correct or no? Um, no, actually, uh, <gasps> they're not released. You're yet. not going to you're not going to put uh, before daylight and pretty and all those <laughs> on it. Oh, man. No, OK, curveball, curveball. <laughs> no, it's a completely different thing. Um, and so, I'm, I'm so sorry. Proud of so it. Um, it is clean the first song that we know from this new EP. No, it's the second song. With Slip Away. <laughs> Slip Away was the first. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. My whole world got <laughs> shook up for a second. I'm just trying to, <laughs> yeah. to hold on to something here. Okay, cool. All right. Well, um, we'll dive into uh, Pretty Next, which came out in 2021. Do your songs usually come together in a specific order? So what I'm asking is sometimes... I just have all these lyrics everywhere and it's like, Oh, you find a good lyric and you build a song around it. And then you add music to it. You find a vocal melody. S sometimes you're just playing guitar and you have cool guitar riffs and you build a song around that and you go, Oh, this is where the chorus would be. And then you find a melody. And then eventually you, the last thing you do is lyrics. Do your songs normally come together in a certain order or are you picking pieces from everywhere and assembling after? Yeah, it's all kind of different for me, to be honest. Um, like I was saying before, I'm, I'm a super, I'm, I'm a neat freak. Like everything has to be super organized um, down to a T. <laughs> and songwriting is the one thing I allow myself to kind of be messy and be free. I have like, you know, countless notebooks in my drawer that I just like, they have songs from when I was seven years old. They have songs from last year, you know, um, <clears throat> it's kind of all over the place. And uh <clears throat> I would say that it's it's a very non-linear process for me. Like I sometimes it's melody, sometimes it's lyric, sometimes it's a guitar thing. Sometimes it's uh, even more recently my producer has given me tracks that I'm just like I'm writing things to. Um so that's new for me too. But yeah, it's completely non-linear all over the place. So on the song Pretty is it programmed drums on pretty and on uh, daylight and then real drums on speak? Is that accurate or is it programmed drums on speak as well? Yeah. Uh, speak of the devil was interesting. We um, recorded drums, but for one reason or another, the, the files didn't sound the way we wanted them to. Um, so what my producer actually did was he took samples from his, his previous um, sessions or wh wherever he recorded these drums from and uh he actually just built like programmed the drums but like programmed like real drums in a sense um so he was like programming like the velocities of them and like and automating every little thing to make it sound like it was a real drummer um but yeah before daylight and pretty were completely programmed wow he fooled me with the uh the drums on speaking of <laughs> yeah yeah, because my like in my notes, it's okay. There's mm -hmm. real drums recorded for Speak of the Devil. So give give your producer a compliment mm -hmm. because I have a background in audio engineering. <laughs> like, okay, real drummer there and then program drums on the other one. So that's that's kind of cool. So what what would you say the yeah. song Pretty is about? So I I kind of shared what I thought the first two songs were about. This one I'll let you share with the listeners what it's about. Yeah. Um pretty. I got influenced from this because I had uh, a friend in middle school who I was super close with. Um, she was like this beautiful girl who like everyone was kind of jealous of and everyone wanted to be in like, um, including myself. And as her best friend, I, I kind of saw what she went through on a day to day life. And it wasn't it wasn't what people would have thought, um, you know, her home life and everything she went through mentally was like it was intense. And uh, I think that if people knew that about her they wouldn't want to be her so badly and I guess the point of the song is like appreciate what you have and don't don't want to you know want to be someone else because you you don't know what they're going through it's it's they could be going through something that you don't want any part of so you know just appreciate what you have and um the one line um uh, don't you want it desperately to be pretty it's kind of like a, a sarcasm like oh so you want to you want to be her you want that desperately like okay try to walk a day in her shoes you know um so yeah that's that's pretty 
Yeah. You know, we, we look at like insanely gorgeous people and we think like, Oh man, that would be the best. So, you know, that, you know, that's what I want. And, yeah. you know, with a background in the entertainment industry, like I'm friends with a lot of ridiculously good looking people and most of them are mm -hmm. as insecure as the rest of us. And they have challenges that, that we don't think they'd have. Like there's one time where I brought a friend, um, out, like whatever, out to a restaurant and she's so good looking that like waitresses would be like, Oh, Hey, I'm here to take, Oh my God, you're so pretty. Like it never stops. And it's like, it sounds like it'd be <laughs> nice to get compliments all the time, but it's also like, mm -hmm. Hey, I, like I'm, I'm a person and I have skills and I'm actually very intelligent. And it's like, you get pigeonholed for everything. And, um, it also becomes your identity, which makes getting older, uh, harder because it's totally. like your looks at some point slip away to some degree. And it's like, that's who they were. And if they can't lean on that crutch, it's like, who am I? So anyways, that's, that's the experience that I've had uh, with people is that, you know, be careful what you, what you wish for. And a lot of times when you complain about your life, mm -hmm. it's like, if you put everyone's problems in a bag and you had to choose by the end of it, you'd end up just taking your own problems back. If you knew how bad some people do. have. Yeah. Uh huh. Totally. Yeah. I agree with that for sure. <clears throat> I don't even know what my point was for that, but, uh, you have, uh, you, you have <laughs> remixes for two of your songs. So I believe it's pretty and speak mm -hmm. of the devil. You have remixes. How, how did those come to be? Is that, uh, f you know, producers or someone that was a fan of the music that thought, Hey, this would be a cool song to mix or to remix. Or did you think, uh, you know, these are kind of acoustic songs that maybe with a beat behind them, they'd be pretty cool too. Years ago, my producer, um, he has a lot of friends in like the game industry who, you know, make sound effects for games or, um, you know, just audio and games in general. And, uh, one of them had heard speak of the devil and he was like that was that's such a cool song like can i get the stems just to mess around with it and we're like yeah of course like he's a super talented person he does his own music thing his his uh stage name is kepler north um and it was like i have no problem giving them to you so gave them to him um this was when speak of the devil came out so it's been it's been a long time and uh he got it back to us and we're like this is amazing like this is so cool and then for one reason or another, it kind of got pushed to the back burner, I think, for a few years until recently where he he was like, OK, I'm, I'm ready to release this now. I'm going to revamp it. I'm going to rework it a little and then we're going to we're going to release it. And so, yeah, that's where that one came from. And then uh, Pretty was another one of my producer's friends named uh, Brian Redmond, who it was kind of the same thing. He was like, that's such a cool song. Can I grab the stems? Can I remix it? And can we release it? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And do you, do you have an, an app on your phone or do you have a, a hard drive that has all these recorded ideas, whether it's melody or lyrics, uh, it's like a database that you can just, when it's time to write and get down to it, you can just pluck this stuff out of there. Yeah, it's, it's a painful amount. Honestly, I need to move them to a hard drive because if I were to like lose my phone, I mean, I guess they're probably on my iCloud, but yeah, and my don't, voice don't memos are don't like count on that. I think man. it's I, I got a new phone, and <laughs> sometimes the iCloud stuff doesn't transfer like you <clears> think <throat> it does, or it saves some things but not voice memos. You don't realize that that's not selected. So, anyways, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's just my messy songwriting habits. I guess I just like it's like I try to name them, but it's like you know if I just have a melody, like I don't know what to name that, so I name it like melody number you know 500 and whatever um but yeah it's it's like almost i think it's almost in the thousands like i have a lot of voice memos and and uh i try to keep the notes down to a minimum like usually when i come up with an idea i'm i'm no i know if it's gonna like if i'm gonna continue it or not um and if i don't i'll usually just like whatever but i always go back to the ones that i remember so uh i'll always kind of like i usually I don't have a problem like naming things right off the bat. Like even if it changes down the road, I just call it what the first thing that comes to my head, like what this is about, what it made me feel like. Um, so yeah, I try to keep it relatively um, down to a minimum in my notes, but <laughs> the voice memos are getting a little out of control. 
Yeah, the the issue with, you know, having voice note number 521 is, you know, it's, it's fine if you're just going back and listening to things, uh, just mm-hmm. to have new ideas. But mm-hmm. if you're searching for something specific, where it's like, wait, what was that one <laughs> melody I had? It's like, how do you know if it's voice memo 531 or 622? And Get stuff, man. The, here's the good news is mm-hmm. you just, you have so many ideas that there's, there's too much, you know, that's a good problem to have. Yeah, it's, it is a good problem to have. It's a good problem. <laughs> what, what would you say is your favorite part of the recording process? Definitely recording vocals. Me and my producer have such a fun time with recording vocals. Um, it's just like, it's such an expressive part of, of the process. And you know, we, we go to the extreme to get that performance, you know, like if I need to be mad that day, like he'll, he'll try to piss me off. Like (laughs) for me to get in that headspace, to be mad, to deliver the right vocal, you know? Um, Yeah. He really does a a great job of bringing a performance out of me. I thought you were going to say he does a really good job of pissing me off, but that's (laughs) yeah, that too. (laughs) That's funny. So let's, let's talk about slip away. So this was released in 2022. This is uh, every year I release my greatest albums of the year list and my best songs of the year. So this is a front runner for song of the year for me. I like, I love this song. Oh, I absolutely you. love it. I've listened to it so much. Uh, the, the song, the guitar playing, the recording, the harmonies, the, the melody, like just to me, it's like, you knocked it out of the park with this song. Um, do you, do you remember when you first came up? with that guitar. So you're not just playing four chords. It's like, there's some intricate guitar stuff going on. You're moving around and picking. Do you remember writing that? Yeah. One of the, uh, I wouldn't say one of the first songs, but one song I learned when I was learning guitar was Blackbird by the Beatles. Um, because who doesn't play that song on guitar? Um, so I learned that one. And then years later, I was like, I just needed some inspiration. And I was like, hey, why don't I mess around with the chords they used in that song? And I was like, but how do I make it not sound like Blackbird? So I, I took a capo and I put it on the seventh fret on my guitar. And I, I did the same chords. And um, that's kind of how Slip Away came to be. Do you have any tips for beginner guitarists? Someone kind of picking up a guitar for the first time. Any advice on how to get good faster than without any help? (laughs) I think something a lot of people don't realize is like you have to have fun doing it to be learning, you know, um, to learn the fastest way I would say is just like be passionate and don't lose that passion. Like do whatever it takes to have fun practicing. Like honestly, whatever it takes, like uh, play a new song, like even if it's easy, um watch tv while you're you're playing guitar i don't know like if you're losing that passion you're not going to be learning anything of value so i think that that's something that's overlooked a lot when it comes to learning how to how to you know do a new skill um another thing is that's more technical i would say use heavier strings because uh they sound better and you don't want to have to go up it's always harder to just go up. If you just start on like really tough strings, you'll, that's all you'll know. And that's, it'll be easy for you. Um, so yeah. <laughs> this is, this is advice coming from playing your dad's really hard guitar where <laughs> there's this much space between the frets and the, the strings. Exactly. Yeah. It, it did. It whipped me into shape. It did pretty quick. <laughs> when, when you're on an electric now, it must feel like you're just like floating. It does. Yeah. I definitely like, I I have less callus than I did when I started playing. Uh, I don't know why that is. I've been playing a lot of electric guitar lately, um, which is probably why, because it's, it's a lot easier to play. Um, so maybe I'm a bit out of shape in that sense, but, <laughs> but yeah, I would recommend going with the heavier gauge. Is, is the song slip away about uh, struggling to be vulnerable about not being able to completely open yourself up to someone else. Yeah. um, Yeah. Imposter syndrome is something that I think a lot of artists struggle with, including myself. Um, It's just like this voice in your head telling you like you're, you're being fake and you're not, you don't deserve your accomplishments. And like, 
um, it's kind of what that song's about, you know? Um, it's like, you can try to hold me close, but just slip away. Meaning like, I'm, you'll never, you're never really going to know who I am because I'm like, I feel fake though. I'm, I'm not, it's just a feeling of like being someone, someone you're not and not being, you know, authentic, even if you're trying to be. Where, where do you think imposter syndrome comes from? Where do you think that stems from? I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I think everyone has it. Like everyone honestly, in every industry, at like totally. every level of success, all, all the artists that have I've talked to that have won Junos or been nominated or been to the Junos, they all felt like with their award, like, why did I get this? You know, they're up against <laughs> like Neil Young and they win and they're like, what is going on? Or they're up against mm-hmm. Rush and, you know, I'm Mother Earth on their first album beats Rush, one of their heroes for a Juno. Mm-hmm. And they're like, what is happening? Yeah, totally. No, it's something that every artist deals with. And it's like, I don't know, it's funny because it almost seems like, like the better the artist, the more imposter syndrome you have which is interesting you think it'd be the opposite but but it's not and I don't know maybe that comes with being vulnerable in in songwriting like you have to put um you have to be like authentic to write a song you can't really I mean you can't really get away with writing a song that people are really gonna connect and feel without being authentic um so I don't know, maybe that's where it kind of comes from. We're, we're forced, not that we're forced, but it, it requires being authentic to be an artist, especially to be in like the public eye, you know, like if you're fake, people are going to pick up on that and they do. So maybe it comes from that. The harmonies in all your songs are, are great. Uh, does hearing and singing harmonies come easy to you? And for an example, um, I, I always just performed alone. So it's like, there was no harmonies. I was the one voice. And, mm-hmm. you know, whenever I recorded harmonies, I would just do like an octave under or like an octave above, like it was never actual mm-hmm. harmony harmonies, you know? And then mm-hmm. I dated an incredible singer songwriter that was like the harmony master. She could hear notes perfectly, sing them perfectly. And I learned a lot about harmony and now I can hear them and sing them. And like, she's complete, you know, that experience completely changed harmonies for me. Um, Mm -hmm. So back to, for you, is it just harmonies are easy? Yeah, I would say so. How dare Uh, you? How dare you with your, your gift (laughs) of natural harmony hearing and singing? (laughs) Yeah, I did in school. I did a lot of ear training. Um, That was one of my favorite subjects. And um, it was something that I was, I was pretty good at um, just like hearing different intervals and and whatnot. Um, Yeah, I think, I don't know. I have a lot of fun with recording harmonies. I think they're one of my favorite things to do. It kind of goes along with the whole recording, you know, vocals with my producer. We, we, you know, treat backgrounds the same way we treat a lead. Um, For example, uh, we, on one of the songs that isn't released yet, uh, we, kind of mocked like a whole choir like he got me in this room actually I'm in the studio right now and uh he got me to stand like in different spots around the microphone and sing as if I was a different person um so that's that's one example of like having fun with harmonies I think that um it goes back to having fun doing something is like gonna teach you the most you know so we've we've covered the four songs that are already out And that leads us to uh, the new single, Clean. So this is out on July 15th. So what what can you tell us about this new song? So if if someone goes on Mm -hmm. your Instagram, I believe there's like a snippet, like 15 seconds or 30 seconds. So you can hear a little bit of it, a sneak peek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote this one. Actually, when the pandemic hit, I I wrote this one. uh, I wrote this one about um, a toxic relationship. Um. Now it means so much more to me, though, with everything going on in the world, it it really kind of relates back to toxic masculinity for me. Um, when we made this song, the way we wanted it to feel was like the track was supposed to be this like, you know, macho sort of vibe in the back. And then the vocals on top are like the female version of things kind of being angry and and at, at this other male figure. Um so I hope we pulled that off. That was kind of the goal to have like that, that kind of, you know, 
butting of heads in there, almost like an argument was happening. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's what you can expect. And the, so you mentioned there's slip away and clean. I'm just making sure mm-hmm. I got the facts down. So slip <laughs> yeah. away and clean are the first two songs from this new five song EP that you might've just unveiled to the world for the first time here, breaking news. Yes, I might have. <laughs> so the, the final three songs, will we hear them for the first time when that EP is released or will you continue to release them one at a time? And then once all five are out, then there's this package deal that comes out as a full EP. <laughs> yeah. I, my plan is to release them all individually. Um, and this is for a couple of reasons. I really want to give each song it's time to shine um, and be be noticed as an independent artist. Um, <clears throat> as you know, it's like, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it's like a singles world out there, you know? Um, That's like before the Beatles, it was all about singles. And then the <clears throat> Beatles had so many good songs that people <laughs> bought albums and then albums became the the way to do it. There's more money when someone buys a full album versus a single. And it seems like now with streaming, we're back in a singles world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. We're definitely in a, in a singles world today. Um, So I think as an independent artist, it's really important to really kind of use each song to its fullest. Um, So that's exactly what I plan to do. Um, And also they're all just kind of different, you know, like they, they fit together. I really do believe they fit together and they belong on the same project um but they're all very different and unique in their own way so yeah i plan to release them one by one (laughs) so you already know what the final three songs are yes yeah are they already recorded um they are oh Oh, man they exist okay are you allowed to give song titles or is that giving too much already uh i don't know if i'll give song titles Okay. I think I'm going to keep that in the back pocket for now. <laughs> Look, I got on behalf of the fans, I got to push for as much as I can get. Right. So now, now yeah. we know the limit. So we'll, we'll stop there. So for, <laughs> for Cassidy's fans, I got as much as I could for you guys, and you'll have to wait for the new <laughs> single on the 15th. And then for the album after that, um, we mentioned before that you, you have the cover of the Taylor Swift song. So I think it's the best day. Is that the name Mm -hmm. of the title? Yeah. yeah. So you do a great cover. You do lots of great covers. So if people check you out on your YouTube, uh, as well as on your Instagram, they'll find a lot of great covers. What are your three favorite covers to do and why? Right now, I would have to say uh, Chinatown is one of them by Bleachers. The song is just so like nostalgic. Um, it's so like, he's such a great songwriter. I can't not cover one of his songs. So there's that one. Um, uh, one of them, another one I discovered recently is called Thank You. Uh, Lennon Stella did a cover of it herself, which is actually the only version I've ever heard, but I believe it's by another artist. Another artist actually wrote this song. Um, it's like a super beautiful, I mean, at least the way she does it is like a, a really beautiful um, song that isn't about a breakup, for once (laughs) um it's actually about well saying thank you to that that person that you love so much because of how much they've you know brought in into your world and how much happiness they've they've given you um which i think is such a beautiful thing so there's that one um another cover song i love like getting inspiration from cover songs more or less than like you know like i really every time i cover a song i really try to make it like a thing it's not just like i i do a lot of a lot of them like quality over quantity is what i'm trying to say <laughs> um lately i haven't been covering a lot of songs i i'm more song right um so there's those top two i've recently learned running up that hill which is also a super fun one just because everyone knows it and like you can go so many different directions with that song so is that the the kate bush song that's at the top yes. of the charts yeah. Are you a fan of Stranger Things? Apparently oh, that's what pushed big... it. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, um, I, you know, I'm always looking at the chart. So today's Friday. Mm-hmm. So all the new albums are out today. So I'll go and get them on Spotify. I'll listen to them. Like I'm just a big music nerd and mm-hmm. I'm looking at the charts and there's this Kate Bush song mm-hmm. that's gone to number one. And I'm like, isn't that a super old song? Yeah. And 
So she just set three all-time records. So it's like Cher used to have the record for oldest person to ever have a number one. She was like 52 or something. Now Mm -hmm. Kate Bush is, I don't know, 60 something. So she holds that record. And then the single running, what is it? Running up the hill? Yeah. Running up that hill. Running up that hill. So that was a minor hit back when it came out in, I don't know, the 80s or 90s or something. So it's the Mm -hmm. longest period of time from the release of a song to when it got to number one. And then it was the longest period between charting and then charting again. So that that song's huge. And then apparently in that same episode, they 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 use Metallica as master of puppets. And now Master of Puppets is charting higher than it's ever charted before as well. So oh the goodness. power of Stranger Things, and you'll like yeah. this as a Stranger Things fan, is I watched the first two episodes of the first season yesterday. So I'm now oh jumping goodness. on the bandwagon. So Oh, do it. Yeah, it's such an amazing show, honestly. The actors are great. Yeah, all those, all those, all those young kids. And I guess yeah. they grow up over, over the show. So yeah. Uh-huh. man it's all a mystery to me right now because two episodes in it's like just they're building mystery and it's like there's no answer so i i currently mm-hmm. have no idea what's going on with the show but anyways do you do you have any advice for young musicians so our listeners there's a lot of musicians some of them are our kids or teenagers if they are you know picking up an instrument for the first time or considering becoming a musician, any advice on, on, you know, h- how to make a name for themselves as a musician. There's a lot of musicians out there, so it's hard to carve your own space. Yeah. Um, I would say definitely what I said before, about the whole, you know, keeping passion and um, make sure that you love what you're doing because this industry is, it's, it's a hard one and it will, it will knock you down if you let it. So um, stay passionate and, always remember why you do what you do. Um, and don't let anyone take advantage of you. Um, because that's definitely something that I think has happened to me a lot, especially as a female, if you're a female artist and a female musician, just know that you are capable. Um, and don't let any, anyone tell you otherwise. Hmm. That's good advice. And I have some kind words from an amazing singer songwriter. This is from Blair Packham. So he says, She's a super talented songwriter with a great voice, and I'm a fan. So that's from Blair. Oh, thanks, Blair. I didn't actually, um, he was a teacher at Metalworks. I didn't uh, take any of his classes, but I wish I would have. I heard good things. See, I I was, I worked at Metalworks for seven years, and uh, he wasn't a teacher when I was there. So I didn't even know he was a teacher at Metalworks. I know him from outside of there. So Hmm. tying it all together today. So, um, (laughs) You, you mentioned at the start that you're a fan of, of nature growing up in a small town. Um, you actually, you love dogs and you love nature. So what is it about those two things that are so special to you? I just think they're so wholesome, you know, like, I don't know, dogs are the best. They're just the best. Like as soon as I moved out, my parents got a dog and I was like, <laughs> I've been, I've been asking for a dog my whole life. Um, I actually made a slideshow of all the different dogs that I wanted and like why we should get each of them. And like, like I was, I was, you know, I wanted a dog so bad growing up. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is about them. They're just, I'm, I'm definitely a dog person. It, it's like your parents, like when you moved out, it's like there was this void that they had to fill and they filled <laughs> yeah. it with a cute furry four-legged animal. Mm-hmm. So do you, so so do you go like the dog that you have now, is it that you go to, to your parents and love on this dog or do you have your own dog or what's going on? Yeah, no, I don't have my own dog. Um, it's, it's really my dad's dog. I would say, um, she's, she's daddy's girl for sure. Um, yeah, she's a, uh, German shepherd, uh, sorry, um, Australian shepherd, hound and, uh, great Dane mix. Um, so very energetic. She, um, surprisingly sleeps a lot. Like she's a really like sleepy dog. Living the dream. Um, Yeah, honestly. Um, she loves outside. She loves living here. I have 
I, I like to finish the interviews with a rapid fire questions section. So are you mm-hmm. good if I blast out these questions, <clears throat> you give short answers, we learn more about you. Does that work for you? Sure. Let's do it. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so you talked about being a foodie before. So my first rapid fire question is if you were somehow on death row, so you are, you are, uh, falsely accused obviously, but you're on death row and they give you (laughs) one final death row meal. What is your, your one favorite meal that would, that would be on death row. You can have a dessert too. and, And a drink maybe. I don't know. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I really love Thai food. Um, I get it a lot, though. But if I was on death row, maybe I wouldn't have had Thai food for a long time. So I'll say anything Thai, like like a pad Thai or like a, a curry of some sort, I'd probably say that. <laughs> yeah, chicken pad Thai is is my my favorite as well. Uh, yeah. Restaurants can yeah. really mess up pad Thai, though. Let's <clears throat> say it's something oh that's like it's either perfect or it's like not edible. So hopefully, you know, some good restaurants. Totally. Yeah. Um, there's one in Milton called the Thai house restaurant and it is so good. Um, we go there all the time. It's the best Thai food place we found. So if you're in Milton, go there. (laughs) Shout out to the Thai house. Uh, so back to some, some music questions. Uh, what, what are some of your favorite venues to play at? Um, That's a great question. Uh, I played at a Juno's chair chair reception um, in June, sometime in June. And the the venue was was really, really nice. It was like it was a bar, but it was like sound treated. Um, And I think it was called it was somewhere within the Massey Hall sort of complex, um, which is new. It's fairly new somewhere in there. And I'm blanking on the name right now. But that place was really cool. What's the best live concert that you've ever seen? Um, bleachers. You like this Bleachers band, right? That's who you yeah. covered as well. Yeah. 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 That's the same guy I covered the song from. He's just like, I don't know. It's just, it was the most authentic show I had ever seen. Like, I don't know. It's sometimes being yourself is the hardest thing. And he, he really like just goes for it. You know, he has so much energy on stage. Mm-hmm. What are some of your guilty pleasure listens? Mm. Is there any music listens? that you're like ashamed of? So I, you know, mm. Tay Tay, I kept that close to my chest for a long time <laughs> and I just let it out, but I have a few guilty pleasures. Mm. Honestly, none that I'm guilty of. I'm pretty open with, with who I listen to. Um, I don't know, maybe Taylor Swift. I don't know. Everyone knows that. But it's like everyone everyone loves Taylor Swift. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's true. Everyone. You know, it's like like... some people make fun of like Nickelback or they make fun of whoever. But Mm -hmm. uh, no, all the music you listen to is cool and everyone and, you know, no, no, nothing to be ashamed of. Um, are, Are there any new artists that you love that you think deserves more attention? Are there any like hidden gems that you could share with our listeners? Definitely. So many. Um, well, Rachel Hickey and Avery Raquel are two artists that I'm playing with uh, this month. They're amazing. Go check out their music. Um, <clears throat> super talented singers. So those are two people that I know. Um, but if we're talking about people that I don't know, um, there's this artist called Dizzy, who is uh, a super cool like indie artist um there's a band called mono whales in toronto who's a, a rock band you may have heard of them um yeah they're super cool um oh my goodness how many would you like <laughs> i could go whatever on. you got go for it um mm, 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 mm. blanking on who i'm listening to right now mm. that's all good if, if more come to you just yeah just speak up on them what what okay. are the what are the top misconceptions that people have about musicians hmm. um misconceptions maybe that we have it all together because like i get a lot of people like saying to me like oh you're so lucky to ha- like have a passion and like have it all figured out you know like you know what you want to do and like while yes i'm so fortunate to have some sort of outlet and like place in the world um, that I feel like I belong, um, like <laughs> it's, it's a hard place to be in, um, being a musician and like 
I think that all of us have that, you know, those thoughts sometime, like, why am I doing this? Like, it's, it's, you know, I want to give up, but we never do because we love it. Um, and like, I don't know. I don't know if people realize like how many, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be rapid fire. I'm like going on. No, go, go ahead. We got, we got time. Um, we got time. Um, yeah. Like I play so many roles as an in, indie musician. Um, I play so many roles. Like I'm a, you know, marketing manager. I'm a social media manager. I'm a publicist. I'm a graphic designer. I'm a videographer. You know, it's all, you kind of have to do everything and learn how to do everything yourself, which I don't think a lot of people realize who that's, maybe aren't musicians. <laughs> that's the misconception. If you could sit down for a conversation with anybody, who would it be and why? Yes. Um, dead or alive. <laughs> it, it could be either. So I used to say, you know, if you could sit down with anyone dead or alive, I used to say that, but then someone said, I'll pick someone alive because someone dead would be awkward or they, they, there was a funny comment. So I'm like, okay, I'll just, I'll just say for a conversation, but yeah, it could be anyone. <laughs> um, uh, you know what? I would have to go for someone who is dead because otherwise I would never get that opportunity. Like um, I would say, I would say Michael Jackson. He is someone who um, I use as influence in my vocal style. And like, he was such a talented singer. Um, he was a great performer and I think performing is what he's known for, but like, he was also just an amazing singer. He was an, an amazing vocalist who just knew how to use his voice. So yeah, I would, I would pick him. That's, that's a good choice. Uh, there, there would be no, the weekend without Michael Jackson. You can hear a huge mm -hmm. vocal influence with the weekend there. So. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And he's very open about his, his love of Michael Jackson. Uh, you're, mm -hmm. you're a fan of video games. What are your all time favorite video games? And, or what are you currently playing now? I, I think my favorite game is Red Dead Redemption. If you've ever heard of that. One or two? Um, um the most recent one, which I believe number yeah. two, because I know that chronologically, like the first one is they're backwards, but, um, yeah. the most recent one is my favorite. Um, though I played both, but, uh, yeah, the graphics on the game are just like, incredible everything about it there's just like every nook and cranny has something to explore um so there's that one what i'm currently playing <laughs> um oh my god i'm blanking on the name um far cry that's what i'm playing far cry yeah. six far cry uh is it with the guy know. from breaking bad is it in cuba or is it the one uh no it's uh it's the one with the cult yeah, so it's five, I think. Five, okay, there you go. <laughs> you start like out in a small town, and there's like a cult in like a out in the forest area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's what um, I'm playing. <laughs> I'm I'm currently playing Red Dead Redemption two as well, and oh nice. I have I have a PS five, and the graphics from this PS four game that's like four years old are as good, if not better than a lot of the PS5 games I play. Like you mentioned, the graphics are like, it doesn't make any sense that it can look that good. And like the amount of detail and it's totally. Yeah, it is unbelievable how anyone can make it look like that. It looks real. Like it's, it had me fooled. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Are are you into books? And if so, do you have any favorite books? Um, I haven't been reading anything lately. I've just been um, super busy. Um, but one book that I read was called uh, i was a simon sinek book he is like i'm really into like marketing and like you know self-help sort of type books um and uh start with why or no i'm actually I, last i have start with why i haven't read it yet but uh That's it so was good. a different simon sinek book i believe and i'm blanking on the name but <clears throat> anyways he's an incredible speaker an incredible author knows a lot about business <laughs> yeah he's he's amazing He's, he's the best. Uh, what is the best advice you've ever received? So maybe this one's a little harder. Yeah, that's a hard question. Um, it's very vague. It's very open. Yeah. Okay. This is going to like, maybe this isn't, I don't know, but the best advice I've ever received, but I was at, <laughs> I was at my brother's graduation. He just graduated high school and um, some, some lady spoke at his graduation and she had you know, graduated from this same high school years ago. <clears throat> and she was talking about um, how to be, 
how to be a good boss and how um, you you really should, you know, inspire people and not, um, you know, micromanage. Um, and she also said that you could get taken advantage of super easily being this kind of way, but um, always tend to the 98% who won't take advantage of you versus the 2% that probably will, even though it's going to happen. But like, just, I don't know, put your faith in people and like, don't, don't micromanage. And I thought that was like, I mean, she put it in much better terms, but uh, it was super inspiring to hear that because I I'd never heard someone put it that way before. That's good advice. Yeah. I've, I've read a lot of books on leadership and it's, it's, mm-hmm you know, dictators don't last very long. You have to be a leader that you, you can't ask anyone to do anything that you're not willing to do yourself. And like, you should Mm -hmm. be out in the front leading by example, not at the back pushing, you know? So I think, I think that's all great advice. So we're done with the rapid fire question. So we're into the final two or three questions. These are deeper. These are, you can have a longer answer. These are harder to to answer as well. Do you have any musical dreams that have still not come to fruition that you have in your heart that you are working towards? Totally. I actually, I have a list of goals for this year, like on my desk, like framed. So I see it every day. Um, And some of them have I've, I've reached, which is great. There are some that were definitely far-fetched for, for this year at least, but I would love to one day get a sync placement, um, maybe even like right for TV. Like um, if someone were to like give me a TV show or a scenario and me like write a song to that, I think that would be super fun. So if let's pretend that it's the end of the year. So it's December 31st, 2022. And it's been a great year. What would have to have come to fruition in your music career for you to say, wow, that, that was, that was awesome. Um, I'm remembering things on my list. One of them was to make merch, which I, I did. I did that. Um, I would love to make a music video at some point. Um, of course this would require a lot of money, so <laughs> that's going to take some time, but, um, hopefully, hopefully, this year. Um, mm, what else? Um, one of them was to play lots of shows. I had a specific number, but you know, as I, as I go through the year, I'm, I'm kind of modifying these goals a little bit because I'm, you know, I'm seeing the way things are going. One of my goals for the start of this year was to have a certain, you know, X amount of followers on this platform. And, you know, I'm starting to realize how Because, I don't know, fans are fans and, and numbers are numbers, you know, it's not, you can't really count success with a number. I think that um, it's just being happy and like being successful and it comes from a feeling, not necessarily like a statistic. So when, when you look back on your life and on your career, what are you most proud of and what are you most grateful for? Hmm. I am definitely most grateful for being able to grow up in an, in an environment that um, was supportive and that I had so many opportunities in. I mean, growing up in Halliburton was like, you know, I got so many opportunities thrown at me. Um, it was just show after show after like, you know, opportunity after opportunity. And um, I, I didn't, I definitely took it for granted. I mean, I didn't know anything else, right? I thought that was just how it was um, until I moved to the city. And I'm like, wow, I I really appreciate that so much more than I did. Um, Where was I going with this? I'm sorry, what was the question? (laughs) What what are you most proud of and most grateful for, for your looking back on your life and your career? So you're, you're, Mm -hmm. you're grateful to your, your hometown that supported you. Yes. Um, Grateful to my hometown proud probably of um my songwriting i think that that's number one for me like i wouldn't i wouldn't sing if i didn't songwrite um and i'm really proud that i've been able to develop that and get better at it over the years so we are down to the final question can you handle one final question oh i don't know there's a lot of pressure on that (laughs) this is this is a big one so if if you could go back in time and you could sit down next to your 10-year-old self 
and you could muster up all the wisdom from 10 years old to now with, with all your lessons and classes and training and mentorship and, and, you know, successes and failures and highs and lows. If you could summarize everything and you could help cute little 10 year old Cassidy Taylor with some good advice to move through her life, what would you say? Mm, I would, I would tell my 10 year old self to uh, work a lot harder than I was Um, just because you know, while I'm so grateful that so many opportunities were, were thrown at me, when I moved to the city, it's like I didn't know what to do at that point. It was like all I had ever known is people reaching out to me and people asking me to do things. It, it never it never was me chasing opportunities necessarily. Um, so I think that that was a big slap in the face for me. So I would I would definitely tell my younger self to just like work harder and like stay true to yourself. Don't let anyone tell you who to be or, or what to do um, and, and have confidence in yourself. I think that I've gained a lot of confidence over the years, but it definitely didn't start out that way. So I would tell her to, you know, be more wary of who you trust and like, just don't be taken advantage of and, and be you. That is all great advice. So we've, we've <laughs> covered a lot over the last two hours. Is there Anything that we miss? Is there anything you just have to share uh, before we wrap up? Honestly, I don't know. We we did a pretty deep dive. We, we covered a lot of ground. We covered <laughs> the important things. Our new single, July 15th. Next show, mm-hmm. July 20th. We got yes. those out. That's what people need to know. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. So where can our listeners find you on social media? If they listen to the two hours, and they go, oh man, I want to reach out to her and and ask questions about the new single or the show, or I want to say, mm-hmm. hey, I love the interview or whatever. Where do they find you online, you and, and your music? My website is CassidyTaylor.com. And that kind of has everything you would need. Um, my username on all platforms is Songs by Cassidy. So yeah, you can find me there. Definitely shoot me a DM. I'd love to hear from you. Perfect. And... <clears throat> Before we wrap up, I want to take a moment to acknowledge you for your pursuit of mastery. Uh, You know, a lifetime pursuit of mastery as a singer songwriter. I want to acknowledge you for following your heart and your passion. You know, being a musician isn't the easiest career to have, but, you know, you definitely would not feel as fulfilled or as passionate doing anything else. And if, if you stick to what you love and you put in the time and you develop that mastery, the money will follow it. Like it all makes it worth it. Um, but you gotta, you gotta have that start and you gotta, you gotta move forward powerfully mm-hmm. and you're doing that. So I commend you. Uh, I want to acknowledge you. you for, um, writing great music for, for, you know, your song slip away is, is in my playlist. I listen to it all the time. Like you've, you've already at this point created some incredible music that makes the world a better place. And, and you're just at the start with all the music that that's about to come out. And then last but not least, I want to thank you as a fan of your music uh, for sitting down with me for the last two hours so that I could ask questions uh, that I want to know the answers to as a fan. So uh, thank you so much, Cassidy, for your time. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. I've never been able to dive deep into this kind of stuff. So I really, really appreciate you having me. You're very welcome. So to our listeners, to the Cassidy Taylor fans, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and I'd love to hear from you guys. My goal is to grow this podcast organically where you're giving me feedback on topics you'd like me to cover and guests you'd like me to interview. You can reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J-O-E-L and on Twitter at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message and I'll see you on the next episode.